Welcome to the Next Level Human Podcast. As a human, you have a job to do. In fact, you have four jobs. To earn and manage money, to attain and maintain health and fitness, to build and sustain personal relationships, to find meaning and make a difference. None of these jobs are taught in school. And that is what this podcast is designed to do, to educate us all on living our most fulfilled lives through the mastery of these four jobs. I'm your host, Dr. Jade Tita, and I believe we are here living this life for three reasons and three reasons only. To learn, to teach, and to love. In this podcast, I will be learning, teaching, and loving right along with you. Grateful to have your company. Here's to our next level. Level. All right, everybody, welcome uh, to today's show. So today's guest is um, someone who I've been following for a little bit now, who is, in my opinion, talking about a topic that uh, a lot of you probably are not aware of, but should be in my mind. And uh, this is Dr. Catherine Clinton. She is a naturopathic doctor like myself. She also is an expert in the field of quantum biology or quantum metabolism, which is a very little known field that essentially looks at how quantum physics is making itself known in biological systems, which up until this point, many people uh, did not really think that that was possible given the wet, hot, you know, sort of macro world that we all live in, that a lot of these quantum effects would be sort of washed out at the macro level. But uh, that seems not to be the case. And we're learning more and more about this every day. And so I wanted to have someone who's been teaching and uh, researching in this field and studying this field come on and talk to us to educate us about this. So Dr. Clinton, welcome to the Next Level Human podcast. I'm really excited. And I guess let's start with um, sort of a little bit about your story and your background and how you even got into this space. Because as as you know, you're one of the few people that I know of who's actually on a regular basis educating all of us uh, in this realm. Well, thank you so much for having me on today. I'm excited to dive into these concepts because This is really what changed the trajectory of my health. So when I was in naturopathic medical school, it was second year. And as you know, it sort of is that initiation year, right? You got to get there at 7 a.m., long hours, um, long clinic hours. And I just didn't have the foundation. It was that proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back, right? And I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, which is a con autoimmune condition that affects the GI tract. I was um, diagnosed with Hashimoto thyroiditis, another autoimmune disease, Lyme disease, um, all kinds of things. And so I was in the perfect place, right? I was in naturopathic medical school. I was right down the hill from an allopathic medical school that I was doing research at. Um, They were very open-minded. I was across the river from an acupuncture school. So I really had every tool at my disposal. And I was able to piece the physical pieces back together. I had to take a break from school and seeing patients, but I was able to, using those natural methods, to kind of get back to where I was before I was diagnosed. So I was able to continue school and continue work. But for those listeners out there who have dealt with a chronic illness, that right before your diagnosed phase is certainly not the picture of health, right? So I kept researching and looking for something that would be that reversal, you know, not walking that line of, oh, if I do that, I get sick again, just that full vitality. And so I was starting to research psychoneuroimmunology, how our thoughts impact our biology, 
which led to mitochondrial function. Martin Picard has done amazing research on how our emotions affect our mitochondrial function. And that right there was what blew open the doors to quantum biology. And when I'm talking about quantum biology, I'm talking about we're finally at a place in science where we have the technology to look at a deeper level, to look at these nano-sized reactions happening between photons of light, electrons, protons, phonons of sound, frequency of emotion. All of these things are impacting the sea of quantum mechanics in the body that give rise to that Newtonian physics, that Newtonian biology we all learned in school. And so it's a really exciting time because we're able to see how these very small interactions give rise to what we see in clinics, symptoms, diseases, um, all of these things. So it's a really exciting uh, field for me to be a part of. And as soon as I got here, I haven't left. There's so much information and it's so mind blowing uh, that it's, it's really exciting to talk about and start using with myself and with my patients. And that's really what uh, cross that threshold of, okay, I'm back. I'm well enough to go back to work. I'm well enough to be productive, but I'm not well, I'm not vital. I'm not thriving. Right. And so that was really the piece that quantum biological perspective allowed me to see a deeper level of health, a deeper level of interaction in the body. Yeah, this is uh, this is really fantastic. And and your story is kind of amazing. I just want for you, the listener, one of the things I want to just point out about Dr. Clinton and, you know, sort of what she went through. When you hear someone say, I had Hashimoto's, I had Lyme's, I had ulcerative colitis. Um, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like one of those, just one of those conditions tends to just devastate people in terms of their ability to function. The fact that you were dealing with sort of all three at the same time is uh, really amazing. And if you don't mind, Catherine, I'd love to just talk about this just for a second, because so, you know, you're dealing with these conditions. Uh, you got it sounds like you were diagnosed pretty quickly all in your second year of, of uh, medical school with all these conditions. Um, and so you alluded to the fact that you sort of got yourself back to at least functioning where you could stay in school just from doing some of the quote naturopathic things, but let's be uh, sort of clear for the listener. We're not really taught anything about quantum biology or quantum metabolism or any of these things at all in naturopathic medical school. And so what I want to uh, just tap into for just a second is this part that you mentioned about mitochondria and how mitochondria are impacted by our emotions, which then got you into the quantum sort of space. So Help us understand, because something obviously happened where you got not just better, but became well and vital. And I'm wondering, is this the beginning of that process? And I'm just curious for um, the listeners to understand what we actually mean and how profound it is that our emotions can begin to adjust something as uh, you know quintessential as the energy factories in every single cell. So if you can unpack that for us and a little bit about how you overcame this completely, I would love that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was working with an amazing mentor, Dr. Ambrose, um, out of Portland, and she uh, really pushed me to look at how I was reacting to things um, and how my emotional reactions and and staying in those emotional reactions, right? We all have emotions. There's no bad emotions, but getting stuck in an emotional reaction can lead to so many things down the line. I'm, I mean, we know from a chemical perspective that those um, emotions of frustration, anger, um, hyper reactivity, all of those sort of reactions can really on a chemical uh, layer lead to inflammation across the board. And that's sort of our starting point for disease now, you know, in, in modern society is almost all of our diseases have this kernel of inflammation. So 
there's so many different angles we can go into this. Like I brought up Martin Picard's work and uh, he's quite clearly showing that different emotions impact mitochondrial function. And those emotions that I just talked about, those more depleting emotions, frustration, anger, fear, uh, those really decrease our mitochondria's ability to function, to flow those electrons through the electron transport chain and to make ATP, which we know is our, you know, energy currency in the body. It's doing other things too, from a quantum biological perspective, but, um, the main thing is that ATP and that energy uh, currency. We can't do anything in a cell unless we have ATP. So there's not a condition, a disease that ATP and mitochondria don't touch. And so it was really my mentors kind of pushing me to look at my own reaction because I had done everything within the body, right? I had done the supplements. I had done the the therapies and the ultrasound and the acupuncture and the <laughs> hydrotherapies and the whatever you have, I probably did it. You know, I was really desperate and thankfully I was a student. So I was able to access these things um, quite readily. And it was through that understanding of my physical body only goes so far. There isn't that line we learned about in school, you know, that separation between the mind and the body. And it wasn't till I started addressing how my own emotions impact my physical health, my mitochondrial health, that I started to see, oh, wow, this is just all pervasive. Our emotions, our history of trauma, chronic stress, all of these things wear down on these really microscopic interactions, the flow of electrons, the buildup of protons. And when we look at, you know, when we zoom out and look at these conditions, autoimmunity, uh, Lyme disease, these chronic infections, these chronic diseases can be looked at in terms of flows of electrons, flows of protons, just breaking it down very simply to an excess in that positive charge and a deficiency in that negative charge. Our cells all have a negative charge, including our mitochondria. And if that isn't maintained, then that's when it starts to stack up. And everyone sort of has their Achilles tendon, right, in their genetics. And mine is definitely the nervous system in the gut. And so that's right where it presented. And it wasn't until I was able to see that connection between the emotional health and the physical workings of my body that I came to understand, oh, okay, this is how the inflammation is really propagating. It doesn't matter how many anti-inflammatory herbs and foods and activities I do. If my body doesn't feel safe, then I am constantly in this state of inflammation. I'm constantly in this state of excess positive charge and a deficiency in that negative charge. And so I think what really, um, Jade, what really opened the door and changed this whole thing was that knowledge of how our emotions and trauma and chronic stress impact our biology and then looking for something outside of what I was currently being offered, therapy, um, you know, cognitive cognitive behavioral therapy, neurofeedback, all of these things are wonderful, but to find that sense of safety in a patch of dirt beneath my feet, in a tree that's growing outside, in the rising and setting of the sun, that was absolutely life-changing for myself. And it trickled down into my family, into my patients. It uh, is, I think, something that as a modern society, we are completely missing. And I think that we have evolved over millennia with these relationships. And modern life really puts up so many obstacles that it's important that we're aware of what living in these houses away from nature 
artificial lighting away from nature, artificial sound. I mean, all of it is having such a big influence on our biology. And when we can really reconnect with those relationships and find health through that safety, it's absolutely incredible. Um, you know, I often use the analogy of a puzzle, right? We've all put together a puzzle and sometimes you get that piece that's frayed on the side. And even though you put it in the right spot, it's still kind of sticking up out of the puzzle. And that's really how I felt for years and years. I am physically, uh, fit. I am healthy according to my labs, but there's this piece that isn't fitting into my place in the world. And that's where quantum biology really allowed me to see, you know, I don't end at the barriers of my skin. I am sharing this information and this flow of electrons and protons with the world around me. And when I can access those relationships, it is really, really profound, the impact it has on health everywhere, mental health, physical health, all of it. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, in part of what you were saying was giving me goosebumps in a, in a, in a sense. And I want to just uh, share with the uh, listeners why. Um, if you listen to what Dr. Clinton is telling us, so she's talking about electrons and protons. And Catherine, you just correct me if I get this wrong, because I'm going to essentially try to feedback and add a little bit, which I may get wrong. And if I do, just please feel free to correct me. But the way I see it is, you know, when when I was taking uh, in undergrad, right, when we were doing organic chemistry, we learned, you know, the stick in the ball, you know, aspect of things and how these molecules uh, sort of work. And but behind that, right, you know, we never we never thought of it as physics. We just thought of it as like, you know, we're doing chemistry. But behind the interactions of these molecules have to do with proton and electron interactions. And so when we think about that, that really is the physics that we're talking about here, right? And so from my perspective, we one of the things that I feel like happened in my education is that we briefly touched on this, okay, here's how these molecules interact, here's how they exchange electrons or these kinds of things. But then after that, it was kind of just like, okay, no more about protons and electrons, let's just talk about the biochemistry uh, here and let's just deal with it on on that level. And you're actually pointing to something that when you go down and look at this electrons and protons and these other, you know, sort of, um, you know, uh, factors that, uh, you know, are responsible for molecules interacting. This is fundamentally an energetic, you know, sort of phenomena. And so then when you bring up something like emotions, then and these things are impacting uh, something like mitochondrial uh, bioenergetics. Um, can you just briefly speak and then, you know, to how are they doing that? So and essentially what it's essentially saying is, you know, these emotions, this energy of emotion is is this changing the electron flow somehow? Is it making the electron transport chain more efficient somehow? Is this, you know, what is actually happening there? And do we know or do you have a theory? And did I sort of explain that correctly, because as we get into this quantum, you know, sort of uh, physics discussion as it pertains to biology, we're really now starting to look at these fundamental particles of, you know, electrons, protons, neutrons, these kinds of things. Correct. So I'm just wondering a little bit about uh, did I get that correct in terms of my explanation of how things are, are going? And then as it pertains to this first part of your story and emotions, how are emotions addressing that do we know because this is essentially saying you know emotions are an energetic thing and they ob obviously must be doing something to the flow of electrons or these these particles absolutely absolutely well your description was spot on and uh when we look at the the influence of these emotions it's impacting the ability of electrons to flow through that chain so yeah. So those more depleting emotions. And I try to stay away from negative and positive because it's a problem if we deem some of these emotions bad, right? They're not bad at all. We are supposed to have all the emotions and we're supposed to have times of lower electron flow through the mitochondria, right? 
It's the getting stuck there. That's the problem. And so, like I said, Picard has done amazing work showing that it actually influences the flow of electrons, which of course, will influence our ATP production. Now, on the flip side, how how is that happening exactly? There are a bunch of theories out there. And I think the most um, salient is the idea of this ordered structured water around the mitochondria, right? So we know that the uh, electron transport chain. It's got those four complexes with the fifth ATP synthase, kind of acts like a motor. It spins to flow that last proton out and create that ATP. But what we're seeing is those complexes are sensitive to light. They're sensitive to phonons of sound. And it's through that structured water that lines those, not only the mitochondria inside and out, but also those protein complexes. So when we're looking at how the mitochondria work and function, what we learned in school is that it's all about electrons from food. And those flow through the electron transport chain, and then we get ATP. If we need more energy, we need more food. And if we look at the obesity epidemic that we have in this country, we know that something's not adding up. More food doesn't equal more mitochondrial health and function, right? Um, so it's a balance between the cofactors that we're getting from those pieces of food, that NADH and, and all those little um, pieces of broken down glycolysis and, and glucose from our food, but it's also how is our mitochondria functioning? It is looking like these mitochondria are really uh, sentinel antennas or sensors for the inside and outside world. And how could that work? That structured water. So why would I think that? Because what we're seeing in the research is that structured water. And let me take a step back for the listeners. What the heck is she talking about with structured water? I was just going to ask you. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Sometimes I just go off and forget (laughs) that. (laughs) Um, So structured water is something that researchers have been talking about for decades, but it wasn't until the early 2000s that Gerald Pollack and his team out of the University of Washington identified this different phase of water. And this phase of water, some people call it the fourth phase of water. Pollack and his team termed it uh, exclusion zone water or easy water. Structured water in the research, it's also called ordered water, cell bound water. I'm sorry to break into the show, but I wanted to take a second to cover one of our sponsors and tell you all about Paleo Valley at paleovalley.com. These are the grass fed sticks that I tell you all so much about that all of my friends know I have on hand constantly. They are in my car. They are at my house. I keep them at my sister's home and my parents' house. I have these things everywhere because they are the simplest, most convenient whole foods protein supplement you can get. Almost like carrying around pure protein, low carb protein in your pocket. They also, these Paleo Valley beef sticks are the only the only 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef sticks on the market. They use organic spices. They are naturally fermented instead of using nitrates and nitrites that can be a problem in some of these cured meats. And they simply taste fantastic. Check out the original or the jalapeno. Those are my favorites. Please make sure you go over to paleovalley.com and visit when checking out, use the code next level for a 15% discount. Remember, our sponsors keep the show going by you giving them your patronage and spending your money on these high quality products. You actually do a few things. One, you're helping to support the podcast. And two, you are helping your health 
And three, you are making sure that good quality companies like Paleo Valley can be out there doing their business, changing the world, making the earth better. One of the things you may not know about this is that grass fed organic and grass finished beef is doing something that is so utterly important for our environment, actually helping to repopulate the topsoil. A lot of people don't know this, but our topsoil is being extremely depleted and raising animals, especially cattle, the correct way helps to get that topsoil back. This is one of the reasons why I love Paleo Valley, not to mention it tastes fantastic, but they're one of these companies like my other sponsors, Cured Nutrition and Organifi that are doing the right things by the environment. I really appreciate everything they do and I hope you will check them out. Thanks so much. Paleovalley.com. Use the code next level. And now back to the show. What we're seeing with that water is that it is building against hydrophilic surfaces. And that's what uh, Pollock found in his lab. And a hydrophilic surface is a water loving surface. And so he started out doing these experiments with Nafion. It's a synthetic hydrophilic uh, polymer surface. And with the addition of uh, infrared energy, it started to build very extensive exclusion zones or very extensive structured water zones. And so the structured water actually acts different than the bulk water that we're used to thinking about as water. And, you know, quite frankly, our ideas about bulk water are kind of uh, a misnomer. We think of that oxygen with the little ears. I think of it like Mickey Mouse, right? You've got that big oxygen with the two little hydrogen ears and all the little Mickey Mouses are floating around in your water when you drink it. But that's not true. Our water is constantly being cleaved. Those hydrogens are being cleaved and added to other forms. It's constantly doing a dance with the influence of the electromagnetic fields in the environment. And so the structured water is different from the H2O that we're drinking. And uh, Pollock proposed that it's actually H3O2. And what's happening is this forms as these hexagonal shapes like a honeycomb. And it's one sheet of this structured water forms on a hydrophilic surface, it acts as a template for other sheets to form. And what they found, and this has been replicated across the globe in many different labs, uh, is that this structured water has a negative charge. And as it's building, if we have any real math-minded people out there, they might be saying, hey, how did we get H3O2? Why isn't it H4O2? Why didn't we just double it? Because those protons are being kicked out of that structured water and they're creating what researchers are calling a proton wire, a proton zone, a water wire. And what this looks like is a battery, a separation of charge, just like we would find in our nine volt batteries. And that separation of charge between negative and positive zones of this water create a flow of water and a flow of protons that is almost instantaneous, meaning that these protons can jump from place to place using this structured water at speeds that we don't see in Newtonian biology. We know that, and this is very accepted science, that each one of our cells is having over 100,000 tasks each second. And we have trillions and trillions of cells. And this is accepted everywhere, but the science that's being taught, that Newtonian bi biology, is, makes that impossible. It is impossible to have that many reactions at that speed using what we know about Newtonian biology. And that's where quantum biology comes in. And this structured water that's forming on our mitochondria, on our cell membranes, on our fascia, on our vessels, seems to be adding and aiding this body-wide network of communication. Mm. And so... Back to the proton or to the mitochondria and that electron transport chain and how these things are acting, how mitochondria 
could be acting as such sensitive sensors, and we know that they are. How does that work? That structured water is able to trap and hold frequency information. We're now discovering that that structured water, you know, it was Bruce Lipton came out with research that was just mind blowing saying that it's not the nucleus of the cell, right? We learned that that's a brain and that's what all the textbooks say right now. But we now know that it's not the nucleus as the brain of the cell. It's the proteins that are embedded in that bilipid membrane, that hydrophilic membrane of the cell. And those proteins are also covered in that structured water. And what we now know is that resonance can be passed from protein to protein via that structured water. And it causes that change in protein shape, leading to biological action. So Bruce Lipton did an amazing job showing us that it's the change in proteins that is actually driving that biological action. And we now know, because we have technology that's sensitive enough to see this, we now know that it's the structured water that's surrounding those proteins that's leading to a change in shape and biological action. So I think that that's what we'll be seeing with further research around emotions and mitochondria. We already know that those proteins in the electron transport chain are surrounded by that structured water. We know that protons are not just flowing through those complexes. They are being jump conducted via that structured water that's on the outside of the proton or excuse me, protein, but also on the inner uh, channels. Those ion channels are also lined with that structured water, creating a network where these protons can flow almost instantaneously. So and my money is all on that structured water and how that is able to trap uh, information from light, frequency information. It's absolutely amazing. And when we look at, you know, John Stuart Reed's and Professor G's uh, research on how sound impacts the mitochondria, we're seeing the same sort of theory being proposed through that structured water, able to pick up on that frequency of uh, the different hertz of sound leading to changes in function. Yeah, this is absolutely fascinating, isn't it? And hopefully now you, the listener, are seeing why I wanted to have Dr. Clinton on, because this, this information, from my perspective, is, yes, the research is there, but it is essentially non-existent currently in uh, clinics in, in terms of how to use this. And so if we're hearing Dr. Clinton correct, what we're actually saying is, you know, that if this is what's going on, then now there is, uh, we're beginning to see actual uh, data that does suggest that things like emotions, things like light, all these energetic things that, you know, were sort of talked about in, in more of a woo-woo fashion, a sound, uh, are starting to have a mechanism to make sense of things like, for example, why do we get, you know, goosebumps and feel this electric charge when we feel, you know, or hear a, an amazing song that resonates with us? You know, these kinds of things that science might not have been able to explain. This is a really interesting uh, aspect of this. And so uh, let me just ask a couple of things about this, this structured water, if I can, Catherine. So is this when when we think about um, structured water? Uh, a couple things that I think might come to mind here. Uh, first thing is, I imagine, is there something that we are doing biologically to make this this water structured when it gets into our body? Because people might say, well, should can I drink structured water then? Uh, is the body creating this structured water? Uh, you know, what is actually happening to, um, you know, create this structured water, so to speak? And can I actually drink structured water? And is that what it is? Because I can imagine a lot of people in their head would be like, oh, I just need to go and find water that's structured or whatever it is and drink more of that. And that's and I'm imagining that, you know, perhaps that's the case, but I'm imagining it's something else. And so that's my first question. What what is exactly how are we forming this structured water? Do bio, all biological systems that are functioning correctly create this? Is this something that 
um, we do through consumption of water? Like what exactly is going on? And I imagine when we think of structured water, it's essentially uh, from, you know, from our skin down to our bone and, and everywhere throughout from our head to our toe. Our, we're basically uh, you're surrounded by this structured water in every aspect. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you're correct. The structured uh, water devices that are out there <clears throat> have done an amazing job with marketing. And so now when people hear about structured water, they go straight to, okay, cool. Can I drink it and get that? And there's a lot of research out there showing that more energized, more coherent water does have benefits for our health. That's not exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about how to increase those layers of structured water against our surfaces in the body. And You know, the answer to both of those, how do we get structured water in our drinking cup and how do we get structured water in our body? Both of those answers are adding energy into the system. So when I'm working with someone, I really focus on them being hydrated, which usually means, uh, you know, everyone's different, but it usually means drinking clean water with minerals added so that water can be pulled into the cells, can be pulled in extracellularly into the matrix. So we're looking at clean water and mineralized water. And that's exactly what we don't have in our municipal tap water, right? It is uh, polluted. And those pollutants actually act as an obstacle to uh, the structured water zone. There's a great study out there showing how glyphosate actually diminishes that structured water zone. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about avoiding the things that decrease that structured water zone within us. And how do we add energy into our system to structure that water? Mm -hmm. And that looks like, uh, you know, really getting that piezoelectric charge from our fascia when we're moving. Movement is a big one. Anything that's utilizing and supporting that mitochondrial health. So we're looking at infrared. We're looking at saunas. We're looking, again, at movement. We're looking at cold exposure, right? You know, being in relationship with the world around us and the seasons around us. When it's winter and we are out in the cold, we are actually creating more mitochondria and really fine-tuning the flow of electrons through that electron transport chain. And that's going to have a huge impact on our structured water because What we think that's happening in mitochondria is it makes ATP. That's the big headline story. What's happening on another side is that our mitochondria are making infrared energy when that last complex of the electron transport chain starts to spin that ATP synthase. It looks like a little, uh, like a little T, right? It's got a, the main complex of the protein, and then these two arms. And the arms spin, creating a magnetic attraction for those protons to flow. And what it's also doing when it spins is it's creating infrared energy. So that infrared energy that's being created in those teeny little proteins in our uh, mitochondria are actually structuring the water within the mitochondria and outside the mitochondria to induce better mitochondrial function. And we're also creating deuterium depleted excuse me, (laughs) deuterium depleted water from our mitochondria, which we know is perfect for structured water. Deuterium is a um, isotope of hydrogen that's much heavier. It's twice as heavy uh, when we look at the atomic weight of those two. And when we're talking about water, we, we classically go to H2O, but we know that a deuterium can take a place of a hydrogen and it can be a DHO uh, type of molecule or it can be a D2O. 
And so we've got light water that the hydrogens are able to flow. Those protons are able to flow through the transport chain versus the heavier isotopes of the DHO or the D2O, that really heavy deuterium full water. And we know that those um, aren't able to tunnel as efficiently through the mitochondria. And for those of us wondering, what is she talking about now with tunneling? (laughs) It's that um, quantum phenomenon of a particle being able to go over an obstacle of energy in a uh, non-Newtonian way. So in classical Newtonian physics, if I have a ball and I want to kick it over a hill, I have to kick it hard enough with enough energy to get over that obstacle. Because of uh, that very early discovery in quantum physics of the dual nature of matter being both energy and matter, right, being a wave and a particle, that that is what's allowing for tunneling to happen. Those molecules can be at multiple places with quantum superposition and try multiple different paths to find the fastest path. And sometimes that takes them right through that hill to the other side without the energy needed to go over. And that's what we see happening in the mitochondrial complex in that uh, electron transport chain. Those electrons aren't bouncing like we saw in those funny little videos in school, they are being tunneled through those protein complexes. And so uh, when we're talking about structuring our water, the water that's being made by our mitochondria is perfectly suited to be structured. So that's harkens back to me saying anything that's supporting mitochondrial health will be helping with that structured water. Um, We talked about cold, uh, same thing with infrared. The sunlight is an amazing um, tool in our kit for how do we get those structured water zones to be bigger. Um, There's so much to that uh, circadian biology, but basically getting sun in the morning in the middle of the day, and then lowering the lights at night really have a profound impact on our mitochondria and our ability to create that structured water within us. Mm. And uh, it doesn't have to be long. You know, we think of, oh, what is she talking about? Like living out in the woods and why that might be great. But no, I'm talking about 10, 15 minutes in the morning. Um, I'm talking about eating your lunch outside or taking your afternoon break outside. And then I'm talking about lowering the lights at night because we know that that artificial lighting takes those protein complexes in the electron transport chain and makes them farther apart. And what that does is conventionally thinking it doesn't do anything because those electrons are able to hop. But that's not how the mitochondria works. It works in a quantum biological way. So if we take those proteins and put them just a teeny bit further away, those electrons can't tunnel anymore. Mm. And so we've got a big problem. So it's really finding the obstacles to structuring water which really look like a laundry list of what we do in modern day life, and then finding ways to add energy into the system. And that really looks like a laundry list of how we've evolved in this um, world that we live on. You know, we've evolved with getting our body in contact with the earth, able to harvest those free electrons that are lining our earth. Again, helping with that mitochondrial function, our relationship with the sun, our relationship with weather, this 70 degree year that we have year round where our temperature never changes, where we don't feel hot and sweaty in the summer or cold in the winter has a profound effect on our biology. And so in a simplistic way, we can really say that structuring our water comes down to 
really limiting some of those obstacles that modern life puts in front of us and rekindling or returning to some of those relationships that modern life has walked us away from. But I want to jump in real quick and tell you about one of my favorite new products. And to start out, I want to ask you a question. If you had to follow your friends around who are not the healthiest in the world and see what they are doing, what would be the number one thing you would probably tell them to do to start? For most people, that's going to be drinking more water, right? This is something that we talk about all the time in health and fitness. It's almost as if we think of it as an afterthought now because obviously water is so crucial. However, we oftentimes get this wrong. For example, did you know that when it comes to hydration, just drinking water can make things worse? Most people don't know this. Why? Partly because most people are over drinking water and under consuming the electrolytes that help water do its job. What we don't realize is that hydration is not just about water. It's about electrolytes, the minerals in there, as well as getting that water into the cells. And so you do not want to be over consuming water if you're not getting your electrolytes right. And this opens up a whole new discussion because most people are not getting their electrolytes right. For example, did you know that low sodium, too low sodium is an issue just as much, if not more so than high sodium? In other words, what we want if we're going to get the right electrolytes is to get the right amount of sodium and potassium and magnesium in the Goldilocks zone. We don't want too much. We don't want too little. We want it just right. This opens up a whole other thing here, too, because people who are exercising, doing sauna therapies, doing low carb diets are disrupting and losing lots and lots of their electrolytes. For example, when insulin is not around and low carb diets, you will excrete lots of sodium. In other words, under that state, exercising, low carb diets, all these things, you actually need more sodium. And so if you're somebody who has been just drinking water, not paying attention to electrolytes, and also feeling fatigued, feeling like you're underperforming, not sleeping right, getting cramps, twitches, headaches, any of these things, then you are probably dealing with an electrolyte issue. This is where the product element comes in. This product has been a game changer for me and many, many of my patients and clients. This is a rehydration electrolyte beverage basically it is a powder of electrolytes formulated with a thousand milligrams of sodium 200 milligrams of potassium and 60 milligrams magnesium without the added sugar and other nonsense that comes in beverages like gatorade this stuff is basically a rehydration beverage on steroids it is the thing that is going to replenish your electrolytes in the right ratios decrease fatigue really correct chronic dehydration. And by the way, many people are dehydrating themselves, becoming hyponatremic, low sodium, when they're consuming too much water. You need your electrolytes on board, especially if you are someone who is losing lots of sodium and other electrolytes through low carb diets and lots and lots of exercise. This is where Element comes in. Element is a new sponsor to the Next Level Human podcast. I cannot recommend this product enough. I have been using this stuff for months now and I have immediately seen changes in my energy levels. I feel like I'm operating on a whole other level and I have seen this as being the primary thing that people who have been using Element have been telling me that their fatigue is getting better, especially fatigue that comes after very intense workouts that involve lots of sweating and lots of intense output from the nervous system. Please check out Element. Use the code next level, drinkelement.com. That's D R I N K L M N T dot com. Drinkelement.com. And let's get back to the show. Yeah. 
Th- this is fascinating, and I'm just going to re- uh, repeat a few things, and then correct me if I get it wrong, Dr. Clinton. But <laughs> so one of the things that you might be thinking as you're listening to this uh, is you might be thinking, okay, well, I think I'm following, but how does this actually change? You know, some of the the things that I might do to improve my health. If you listen closely to what this discussion is telling us, is that it really begins to change everything because. Well, one thing I'll just repeat a little bit about uh, enzymes. So the old way of thinking about this, you know, my my undergrad is in biochemistry. So the old way to think about this is that you have an enzyme and a cofactor and this enzyme has a certain, you know, let's say speed at which it can do these uh, mechanical, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, manipulations uh, and, you know, change one compound into another compound. What what Dr. Clinton is telling us is that Certainly, this is likely going on, but more likely what is happening is that these enzymes are able to do all these. Remember all the the interactions that she was telling us that go on in a cell, that it's impossible for a cell to carry out all those functions just through sheer Newtonian, you know, sort of mechanics that these tunneling effects and uh, other quantum effects are what is allowing the cell to do this. And that this structured water is having a profound um, impact. Here And it sounds like what you're saying, too, is that the mitochondria, um, the structured water helped the mitochondria do their job and the mitochondria helped structure the water in a sense. And so there's this sort of feedback, a sort of loop that happens here um, with the mitochondria. And then I just want to go through really quick, Dr. Clinton, and talk about some of the things that now that we have this understanding, some of the things that may have seen seemed woo woo uh, previously start to make some sense and you alluded to them. So I'm just going to go through some of them and, and just see if, you know, you can kind of just say, yep, yes or no. But now grounding, going out and walking around on the earth, this would seem to um, be able to take advantage of this charge. If we, if this structured water is sort of giving us a whole charge, then we're able to interact in a, in a sort of charged way with the earth. Would that be correct? And this is the mechanism by how that might be working. Yep. Absolutely. That's absolutely okay, and then, correct. Yeah. And then we have, you know, sunlight, which you alluded to. And so in a sense, in a very real sense, it's not just tanning us and giving us vitamin D. It's actually um, contributing to this ener- this quantum energetics and, and structuring our water in some way. And so in that particular way, I guess we could also say that, you know, we're not plants doing photosynthesis, but the light is contributing to our energy in, in, in the ways that food might, which, which would seem bizarre to a lot of people because they might be like, look, we don't do photosynthesis, you know, so what are you talking about? However, based on what you're describing to us, this light is obviously having an impact on our energetics, uh, you know, in, on a quantum uh, level. It's not saying we don't need to eat and it's not saying we're plants. It's just saying that this is, you know, essentially having an impact. So now we have light. You mentioned sound frequencies, you know, so these things like, you know, maybe the old Tibetan ohms and Tibetan music bowls and things like that. And these sound bowls, maybe these are having an effect here. Um, you know, thought, which I think is, you know, thought and emotion, which I think is really, really interesting here. And then, you know, perhaps an esoteric thing. But then what about the energetics of our food and where they where it comes from? You know, I can imagine if you go out and you kill a deer and you eat that deer sort of right away and you, um, you know, uh, to use the Native American ways, you know, you pray over it, you ask, you know, f- you give gratitude, you're infusing this with particular feelings and energies. It's very different than, you know, how we are processing foods elsewhere. And so some of these things that might seem woo woo and very out there now seem to make a little bit more sense. Uh, is there, any, and then, and you mentioned heat and cold, right? So hot and cold mm-hmm. therapies uh, both do this as well. One of the things I want to ask you about is infrared, uh, infrared light. So, you know, the red light therapies and infrared saunas and also a pulsed electromagnetic fields. Uh, are these two things uh, tools that we can use uh, and have any merit in this new way of looking at things? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we know red light goes right into the, that complex and those. Uh, we're not plants, right? Mm-hmm. But. If we take the definition of getting energy from the sun as photosynthesis, then we do photosynthesize, right? Mm -hmm. Because we are able, those proteins in the electron transport chain are able to capture a photon of light and use that 
to create more efficient flow of electrons through that chain. And, you know, there's so many ways we could go so many different directions we could go and it's it's really interesting because earthing or putting our feet on the ground and coming in contact with that sea of electrons is impacting so many different things and when we look at um that input of electrons and that ability to keep that negative charge in the mitochondria. You know, we think of mitochondria as those little beans, like maybe, you know, that little bean shape we learned in school with the little squiggly inner membrane, and that's our mitochondria, right? But what we now know is that mitochondria can leave the cell. They can be extracellular. They can donate electrons to other cells that need it to the sites of injury. I mean, it's really phenomenal when we look at what a mitochondria is doing. And it goes way beyond that bean shape. And in fact, that bean shape of a mitochondria is a reaction to a danger signal. So that's a mitochondria that is reacting to a danger signal in the environment, whether that's lighting or a toxin or an emotion or a sound. And a mitochondria that is in a state of safety, in a state of working with the community, doesn't look like a bean at all. It's all stretched out. It's creating electron uh, chains that actually connect mitochondria and can donate electrons over long distances in the body to sites that need it. And so it's absolutely incredible when we start looking at these things that we thought were woo woo, right? But what really, it's not negating what we learned with Newtonian biology. It's giving us an understanding of why that enzyme is catalyzing right then, right? It's not just this random thing. And that's what we've been taught. It's just random. You know, you've got these receptors and you've got these keys in the body. And when that key randomly finds the right receptor, there'll be that lock and key mechanism, which will create biological action. But it's not random. We know that these things are happening from a deeper level, from a quantum biological level. And we've had such a long history of, uh, you know, fighting against the woo. We want to see it under a microscope. Don't talk to me about singing bowls. <laughs> you know, I want to see it under a microscope. And now we can see these things happening. And now we have a mechanism for those things happening. And it's, it's really exciting because it allows us to go beyond that chemical model. It doesn't negate it, but it says there's a deeper thing happening. And that means that, that we are not as reliant on that chemical mechanical model of meth, um, medicine that surgery and pharmaceutical drugs are the end all be all. It's not that there's not a place for that. But if that was the end all be all, we are in a sad state because we know that that is not going to take us out of this epidemic of chronic disease that we have right now. And so, yeah, absolutely. All of those things are happening at a very profound level. And we now have the research to see why they're happening. We now know that grounding, uh, again, coming in contact with the earth or something that's coming out of the earth, right? Tree huggers, turns out they were right. We can actually gather electrons from that. We know that when we expose um our body to the rhythm of the sun, it sounds so like, uh, okay, that is not exciting. I want the newest, latest thing. But the newest, latest thing is the understanding that every single cell in our body has a circadian clock. And that clock dictates our metabolism, our immune function, our cardiovascular function, our respiratory function. I mean, you pick a system and we'll talk about it. It is circadian based. So if we don't have that input from the sun, that whole cascade is completely uh 
deranged. And it leads to what we're seeing in, in this country is a widespread epidemic of metabolic diseases, immune diseases, cardiovascular issues. And then if you want to add on top the fact that Okay, so those circadian clocks are being uh, aligned and being informed by the light that hits our retinas, right? And this is not looking straight at the sun. It's being outside, right? You do not, and I do not think you should look directly at the sun. That's that's uh, going to be damaging. But if that light enters your eyes, that early morning sunlight, it is going to set up all of that uh, biochemical cascade, our hormones, our dopamine, it sets up pregnenolone production. And pregnenolone, you know, is that master hormone that goes on to make our sex hormones, Mm -hmm. testosterone and estrogen. I mean, it's just absolutely foundational. And then, Jade, if you add on to that, that our skin has the ability to split water, and create more potential hydrogens in the body. We have everybody out there really excited about molecular hydrogen, right? Um, blue tongues, methyl <laughs> blue, and yes. Um, but not many of us know that when our skin is in the sun, when sunlight hits melanin, it splits water, creating that pool of potential hydrogen within us without a need for a supplement. And I'm not knocking that supplement at all. It can be very helpful. I'm just saying these tools exist within us. This is how our body works. And it's absolutely not what we think of. No one is out there thinking, oh, okay, I'm getting a big boost in my hydrogen pool and maintaining my electrical charge when the sun hits my skin and the melanin splits the H2O in my body. Um, But that's what's happening. And so we see this vast sea of quantum biological action powering what we learned in school. And it's, it's exciting. It's thrilling for me. Uh, It's, it's mind blowing. And it really brings us full circle to what some of these ancient indigenous cultures always knew and, and acupuncture. It's amazing to me that almost all the indigenous cultures I know of utilized these techniques for better health. And did they say quantum tunneling and, you know, all these different things? No, of course not. What they had was this space in their life and in their culture and society to observe, Mm -hmm. to observe this does that. And they didn't care how, or I I don't know what they cared about, but, you know, they didn't uh, use this terminology. It was just an accepted and respected fact of life that we go hand in hand with the world we live in. Yeah. And so we're, we're running up on time and I want to be respectful, but I have one more question for you, if you don't mind. And it's something that I think will um, sort of uh, finish this conversation. Obviously, there we could go into so much more here. But one of the things I just want to get your take on is when most people I think here, most um, most lay folks, you know, when they hear quantum physics or they hear anything quantum, what they tend to think is they tend to think this is you know, like the secret or something, or like, you know, it it all has to do with like, let me think positive thoughts and positive things will uh, come to me. And so I just want to address that briefly. And, and, and in that conversation, I want to ask you uh, to share with us as just finishing this up is where do you think this is going? Uh, Where do you, in in other words, where do you think we're going to end up? You know, I'm curious, you know, because from my perspective where I've gotten to as a clinician, and these are two questions I'll remind you, but I'm, I'm going to just, you know, have this thought really quick so everyone can hear. But as a clinician, one of the things I've seen, Catherine, is that, you know, it's it's been frustrating doing this work for, you know, I mean, I've been doing I, I started personal training at 15 years old. I've been a naturopathic physician and in the clinic 20 years. It's frustrating because most of the tools that I use, if I'm honest, um, don't seem to have the effects that I thought they would. This includes diet and exercise and supplements and all these things. But some of the more magical, quote, magical things that I've seen 
come from people and their belief systems and just simply what they believe. And, uh, you know, uh, to me, it's always bothered me a little bit, which is why I'm going back to school to get my Ph.D. in transpersonal psychology and why I'm having this conversation with you and why I'm very much into quantum physics and all this stuff. And so the question is two part. One, most people think that quantum just means I get to wish upon a star. I wanted to see what you think about that. Maybe that's true. And then the other thing is I just want to hear your take on where this is going. And do you, you know, see what I see that perhaps there's something different about um, we humans and our belief structures and our connection to other people and our connection to the earth that perhaps is driving more of this than we think. And I'm just interested in your final thoughts on those two things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I get so much pushback from this, like, what do you mean quantum? Um, you know, you're just a huckster talking about the secret. <laughs> and and I understand. I totally understand. Um, telling people that they are totally in charge of where they are in life and they can manifest this and manifest that can be really problematic, right? Because we, most of us don't live in a world where we are safe and able just to manifest all these things, right? But at the same time, well, first, let me say that quantum physics is the most, uh, there is not a, th theory currently out there that is six, as successful as quantum physics is at answering things. So we just have to also understand that, that the science behind this theory is beyond what we've seen in other theories, meaning that it hasn't been proven wrong yet, right? And it explains things that are current theories just can't do. And this is something that we haven't seen with anything else. And so when people start talking about that idea of like, oh, so I'm just supposed to wish upon a star and get better as someone that was really, really sick. I mean, I think I, I mentioned that my mentor was pushing me. She didn't suggest she had to push me to realize how my thoughts were impacting my health. But I think from a quantum perspective, what we're now understanding is that these very small pieces of our biology, electrons, protons, photons of light within us, which we create, biophotons as well, these pieces are able to access what many researchers are looking at as the biofield. Mm -hmm. And again, this can bring up uh, ideas of like tuning forks and uh, hippie festivals and just woo woo. But there is extensive research on the biofield and its effectiveness. There's also, it's really moved out of that fringe science. We've got MD Anderson doing research on how biofield uh, touch therapy decreases tumor growth. That's conventional, that is mainstream, and it's exciting because we can't stay here. If we call this the pinnacle of health, oh, it is not <laughs> anywhere close to a pinnacle of health, right? We are sick, sicker than we've ever been as a society, and we need another level to understand how energy influences our our biology, right? And so when people come with those kind of preconceived ideas, I completely understand. And I completely understand how problematic it is for someone to say, well, just access the field and, you know, wish upon a star and it comes back. And if it didn't come back, then you weren't doing it right type of mentality. That's not what we're talking about. There is a field component to it, right? We can measure the biofield of a cell, of the heart, of the brain. We've been doing EKGs and EEGs. We are familiar with that biofield, but there's also a subtler a more subtle biofield that is being accessed by some of these modalities. And it's finally being looked at through the lens of the scientific method. And that's what 
as a society, we really need to go forward. That's what convinces people. It's not me talking about how to access energy. It's those MD Anderson research articles that we can point to. It's looking at a higher powered um, microscope or an MRI used in a different way and saying, look, this is what's happening. We like to see. We're here in the matter. We want to see it, right? And so I think that quantum biology offers that and it's really exciting. And to address the next question of where I think it's going, I think that we are going to be understanding these more subtle biofield uh, interactions as a as evidence of these quantum interactions of entanglement, right? Like you started out the conversation talking about entangled protons in the brain. It's it's pretty much accepted now that this is how birds make their annual migration, right? They don't have a map under their wing. What they have is an ability to access the magnetic field of the earth. And they send out, as light hits the, the retina, it sends these photons that are entangled and allows that bird to nag- navigate via the magnetic field. We've found that in the brain. We've found that in human cells where we uh, wiped magnets over them and saw that they actually fluoresced and lit up due to those radical pairs, those entangled electrons. So I think what we're going to start seeing is that these universal truths we've had as as a society, as, as a culture, universally, I don't know of any indigenous culture that didn't have a deep respect and reverence for this flow of energy and that utilized it effectively. We now have a great depth of these robust research on acupuncture and Reiki and all of these things that are using that biofield. And potentially what I think we'll we'll start to see is this is being accessed through um, quantum physics, through spin of electrons, through entanglement. Um, And to be honest with you, When I look at it, I am not a math major, and it is not my strong point. So when I look at quantum physics research, I accept the math that's being given to me. I don't try to prove it wrong because that is not my strong suit. But there is a piece in in quantum physics that seems to be missing. And like with tunneling, it doesn't, from a common sense perspective, it doesn't make a ton of sense unless there's another field that that electron is accessing, right? How does it get from straight through the hill? Like I just, maybe, maybe I need an evolutionary jump or maybe quantum physics needs another um, explanation of how these things are working. And I think that's what the future holds, that we're going to be diving deeper into these fields of energy, magnetic energy, electromagnetic energy, these subtle biofields. And just like we have the technology to uh, measure our biofield of the heart and the biofield of the brain and use that quantitatively in medicine. That happens thousands of times each second in this country. We are using that right now. And I think where we're headed is being able to assess energy on a different level, on a quantum biological level. And that will allow us to really come full circle so that Things can't just be replaced by a different part or a a different chemical that, you know, a synthetic compound, that there is an inherent energy in each element, in each molecule, in each electron that is profound and guides us to an understanding of how interconnected this world really is. And so I couldn't be more excited about where this is going. I've got my research that I do. almost daily because it's so exciting to me. I just can't wait to see that next chapter being written. Yeah. And, you know, Dr. Clinton, we're, we're really, you know, I'm, I'm just, uh, 
we're indebted to people like you. Thank you for doing the work. Thank you for educating us. Um, for those of you listening who, uh, if you follow Dr. Clinton, uh, it's it's Dr. Catherine Clinton, right? At Dr. Cat- Catherine Clinton. So if you yeah. follow her on Instagram, where I follow her, you'll get a lot of amazing free information. She's an amazing educator. She also has a a program uh, that for those of you, because there's a lot of, I don't know if I told you, Catherine, but there's a lot of practitioners who listen to this show. So lots of MDs, lots of NDs. Uh, you know, I do, you know, continuing education stuff on metabolism for MDs, NDs, DCs. So there's a lot of them here. So a lot of them are probably going to want to get involved with your your course. And I know you have a course. I actually had my girlfriend buy it. So I've been going uh, through it. So I, I and it's it's amazing. Um, tell us, tell them what that course is and where they can, they can find that as well. So, uh, at DR Catherine Clinton on social media, and then your website, I assume is where they can find the course. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Dr. Catherine Clinton everywhere on Instagram, Facebook. Um, I'm Dr. Catherine Clinton.com. So it's pretty easy. redundant, but easy to remember. Yeah. Um, and I do, like you said, I love to share this information and I love people to grasp it because I think a new paradigm in health really comes from us understanding our health and disease in a new way and then demanding a change, um, you know, from the bottom up. So I love sharing this information. If anybody wants to continue the conversation, I'm at all those places. I've got courses, but I do share a ton of information on social media, just trying to lead the charge to a different way of thinking about our health. Yeah, I'm sure um, people are going to want me to have you back. So hopefully I can I can convince you to come back on in the future and have uh, more discussion. But thank you so much for all that you're doing. And and do me a favor, Catherine, just hang on. I'm going to stop recording, but just don't hang up yet because I just want to make sure the, re- the recording captures everything. But uh, for all of you listening, thanks so much for hanging out on the show and we will see you next time. You have been listening to the Next Level Human podcast with Dr. Jade Tita. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure you subscribe and consider leaving a review. You make the biggest difference when you pass on your lessons and inspire others. That's why reviews like this are so powerful. Your words may be the only ones that resonate for someone else. Please remember the information in this podcast is for educational purposes only. Always consult your personal physician or therapist before making any lifestyle changes. And finally, thank you for who you are in the world and the difference you make.